And what else have you been up to on the on the hill? Medea, Medea. Medea you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the hearing, uh, we were saying, why are they rehashing what happened several years ago instead of a hearing, which we have not had any on, about what is happening in Gaza and U.S. complicity with that. So we were uh, very uh, disappointed that these two generals were brought in, brought in to look back at whether the U.S. should have left Afghanistan, how it left Afghanistan, the Republicans using it as a way to trash Biden and uh, the Democrats trying to defend themselves uh, when it really uh, is, is not particularly relevant right now uh, to the crises that are going on in the world. So that was what happened on Afghanistan. But we have been continuing to go through the halls of Congress and trying to uh, prevent any bill to get to the floor that would contain more money for Israel. Uh, some of you might have been involved in the calls that we were doing to try to stop what's called the discharge petition. It looks like that has become dead in the water. In fact, there were two of them, and it looks like neither of them are going to get anywhere. The Senate bill that was the $95 billion that included Ukraine and uh, uh, Israel together, uh, it looks like they're going to try to divide them up in the House and have a standalone bill on Ukraine and a standalone bill on Israel. But there's still disagreement among the uh, Democrats and Republicans on what that should look like. Should the Democratic, uh, should the standalone bill on Israel have any humanitarian aid and risk losing the uh, uh, some of the Republicans? Uh, should it have any conditionality and risk losing the Republicans? Um, should it have no humanitarian aid and risk losing more of the Democrats? That's the kind of ridiculous stuff that they're going through right now instead of saying, why in the world would anybody want to vote for more money for Israel? And then there's the issue of UNRWA funding. And as far as we understand it, the uh, <clears throat> the appropriations bill, which is the bill to fund the government, they have been fighting about whether to have an UNRWA ban in that uh, or not. And that would be money for UNRWA that would come from the State Department. As we understand it now, and we'll see the actual bill tomorrow, uh, there is a prohibition on spending, on giving money to UNRWA for use in Gaza, but uh, there may be funding for UNRWA in other countries. Um, so Democrats have sold out the people of Gaza once again. And that's more or less what we know. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to put anything together this week, and then they're on vacation for two weeks, which means we have more time, yay, to be contacting them, calling them, going to their local offices, going to their homes, whatever we can do to tell them very clearly, no more money for Israel. Thank you. Thank you. And no more money for uh, continuing the war in Ukraine either. We want a peace settlement there. We want a negotiated peace, not World War III. Macron from France is talking about sending a couple of thousand troops, French troops, into the, the battlefield there. So it's a very tense situation. Uh, I'm glad to hear that Congress is tied up in knots over this. Uh, Democrats want that Ukraine funding, right? And so they're concerned that if they have the Israel funding separate, they won't get their Ukraine funding. And meanwhile, you know, they can't get anything passed. OK, uh, so that's what's happening on that front. Please do stay with us throughout the program because our capital calling party will be focused on the funding of UNRWA. And as I understand it, Biden could unilaterally restore that funding before the Republicans in the House tried to permanently prohibit the president from funding UNRWA. Trump suspended funding for UNRWA, about $300 million. I think it was about $400 million at the time that Biden suspended it, based on false reports that uh, UNRWA employees, a dozen of them, collaborated with Hamas on October 7th. And now UNRWA says its employees say they were, well, Reuters says coerced. Let's call it torture. They were tortured. They were waterboarded. They were beaten. 
their families were threatened if they didn't make these false confessions. And so, as Medea mentioned, a number of countries have restored funding to UNRWA, but President Biden has yet to do that. And uh, I don't know what he's waiting for. He's waiting for a divided Congress to force his hand. Uh, we have to force his hand. So do stay with us. We'll be calling Capitol Hill to say restore funding now to UNRWA and no permanent prohibitions. And Marcy, All right, with that, a, we should say that there was a great victory in Canada. And I know we have some Canadians on now. And maybe in the chat, you can tell us how the heck you managed to get through uh, your uh, government an agreement to send no more weapons to uh, Israel, which is quite remarkable, and to call for a permanent ceasefire. So we were very excited, in fact, amazed to see that news from Canada. Absolutely. I, I know I read the Canadian Parliament votes not to send any more weapons to Israel. Yes. Absolutely no more. And we're going to hear more about the weapons that we are sending and who's producing them from our experts at the American Friends Service Committee later on. Well, in just a few minutes, actually, because Hania, our co-host, is going to introduce them. Hania, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marcy. And I do encourage everyone to please post your questions in the chat. We will ask um, our speakers once they're done speaking. Uh, so um, it brings me nothing but great pleasure to uh, introduce Dov Baum and uh, Davi Sherman. Dov Baum is a PhD who is the director of the AFSC Action Center for Corporate Accountability. She was a co-founder of the Coalition of Women for Peace in Israel, uh, the WHO Profit Research Institute, and the Black Laundry Direct Action Group. Dov holds a PhD in math from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Davi Sherman is an investigative uh, research fellow at AFSC Action Center for Corporate Accountability. She researches corporate uh, complicity in the prison industrial complex, the migrant control industry, and the Israeli occupation. She received her graduate degree in criminal justice policy from the London School of Economics. Uh, it is an honor to have you both. Uh, please do take the floor. Um, Dov. Thank you so much, Hania. Um, and uh, and thank you, Code Pink, for inviting us to talk about our recent research. I would ask Grace to share our slides for us. Um, I'll start just by saying that our Action Center for Corporate Accountability has been uh, working uh, for some years in trying to collect information for activists and also for investors about corporations and their complicity in specific acts of, of state violence and human rights violations. So uh, Grace, maybe you can click on slideshow to start the slideshow. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and, and let's go to the next slide. This is one of our main products of the Action Center. And I want to encourage you all to check it out. We will not talk much about it today. It is called Investigate, and it is our main database. It has hundreds of companies that are profiled for their specific violations. And it also allows institutional investors to screen their investments for these companies. So this is a tool for divestment. So today we will describe some of our research and give some examples and some lessons learned and I will end by telling you about some things that we can all do. And one of them, of course, is divestment. So have that in mind. Investigate.info will be the tool you can use for divestment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, like many of you, uh, I hope we've spent the last five months uh, in grief and in horror and in prayer uh, and in the streets protesting. And uh, I took some pictures here from demonstrations I've been to in the Bay Area uh, using the symbol of the white kite. Um, and uh, I, I hope you know the origin of the white kite. Uh, the white kite comes from a poem of uh, an old friend of the AFC, uh, the uh, late Palestinian poet Rifat El Arir. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, Rifat El Arir uh, lived in Gaza and he was killed by an Israeli attack and he actually knew that this would happen or he 
fear that would happen. And this is the, the white kite symbol comes after his famous poem that you can see on his left and you can check online about how his death will be transformed into a story uh, of hope. And, the, and that symbol is the white kite that we see in, in, um, in those demonstrations. Uh, Rifat was one of the contributors to a book that was published by FSC, Light in Gaza of Short Stories. And I'm using this for, uh, uh, to, to promote the book. It is free on Haymarket uh, books. You can go to the publishers and get it as a free electronic uh, book, you know, to respect his and other people's contributions to stories about Gaza. Next slide, please. The reason why I highlighted Rifat El Arir's life and death is because uh, a week before he was killed, this is one of the tweets he published uh, with a picture of an, a shell that fell in Gaza and the inscription made in USA. And we see it as his legacy. He asked us to look into those munitions. He wanted us to know that this was made in the US and he wanted us to take responsibility for it. Next slide, please. So this is what resulted from this call for action from the late Rifat el uh, For the last five months, uh, we have put a, a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, our team of, of three researchers, two of them are here. Uh, our third researcher, Noam, couldn't join us today. He's, he's sick, uh, unfortunately. Um, and this is a project that is also in collaboration with the uh, Israeli project DIMSI, the database of Israeli military and security exports. Check it out, dimse.info. And Who Profits, which is an institute that collects information about corporations complicit in the Israeli occupation, whoprofits.org. All of these resources are out there on the web for you to, to use. So please check them out, use them, share them as much as you can. And what we have done over the last five months was to track any and all publications, and including social media, including personal reports from soldiers, including Israeli media, whatever we could find about specific weapons being used in Gaza right now by the Israeli military, but also in Lebanon and Syria and the West Bank as part of this flare up of hostilities. And we wanted to document which weapons are being used, but also which are the companies that produce them and supply them, track any supplies we can track, and see if we can connect any of these weapon systems to specific incidents and specific war crimes as part of this genocide in Gaza. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, now I want to introduce uh, my colleague Davi, our investigative researcher, who will share with you some of the stories of the specific uh, complicity of some of these companies. Thanks, Dove. Before I talk about some of the specific companies whose weapons and technologies are being used by Israel, I just want to state something that I'm sure at this point is incredibly obvious, that war is a racket, in this case, genocide is horrifyingly a racket, and corporations, many of which, if not most of which, are based in the U.S., are benefiting and profiting off of Israel's attacks on Gaza, on Lebanon, on Syria, tremendously. In the immediate aftermath of October 7th, we saw the share prices, for example, of major U.S.-based weapons companies increase exponentially. This was on October 9th, two days after October 7th, the first trading day. You see here RTX's share prices increasing, Boeing's share prices increasing. Every major weapons company that for decades, not just during Israel's current genocide, but for decades, has been supplying Israel with weapons. You've seen their share prices increase, indicating the future profitability of Israel's attacks on Gaza. Now, more than five months later, you still see in mainstream news media especially, framing Israel's current attacks, current genocide on Gaza as an opportunity for investment, pitching which companies, institutions, 
and individuals, folks like us, although not in this room, hopefully, who invest on an individual basis in these companies. If you could switch to the next slide, please, Grace. Thank you. And while Dove will touch on this a little bit later, sort of the secrecy that shrouds US weapons transfers to Israel. And so it's hard in a lot of ways to track the exact profitability that these companies are gaining from Israel's attacks. You have high level executives in RTX, at Lockheed Martin, at all of these companies saying very explicitly how Israel's genocide is lining their pockets, that an increase in DOD spending, Department of Defense spending, and increase in transfers of weapons to Israel is really great for these weapons manufacturers. This is what sustains these companies. If you could switch to the next slide, please. Again, here you have another high-level executive, this time of General Dynamics, talking on a call with investors, saying that obviously the Israel situation, as he sort of flippantly calls it, is a terrible one. But if you look at the damage, at the incremental demand, rather, and the damage coming out of this, of course, the biggest one to highlight is on the artillery side, so on a specific weapon system that General Dynamics is sending to Israel. And we'll see that on the next slide, please, Grace. So General Dynamics is the only weapons manufacturer that manufactures 155 millimeter artillery shells, which Israel has been using throughout its attacks on Gaza, also on its attacks on Lebanon. The U.S. has sent tens of thousands of these artillery shells to Israel, and that's despite major leading, major human rights organizations like Oxfam, Amnesty, and others warning that the use of these weapons is essentially in and of itself a guaranteed war crime. These weapons are completely indiscriminate. They cause mass harm to civilians, mass harm to civilians. These are not, not as if this would, of course, make it any better, but targeted, precise weapons. These are designed to inflict mass harm and indiscriminate harm. And in this photo, you see a young girl, a 12-year-old girl, who was sheltering in Khan Yunus at Nasser Hospital when Israeli soldiers fired a 155 millimeter artillery shell into the hospital. It didn't explode, but it killed her and injured others. And despite, again, that these weapons have been tied to war crimes, that their use is inherently indiscriminate, the U.S. continues to send them to Israel. In recent weeks, I believe, maybe even recent days, reports have come out with Israeli officials saying that they're running out of these artillery shells. In the first two months alone, a single Israeli brigade in Gaza fired, I think, some 10,000 artillery shells into the Gaza Strip and Lebanon. So that speaks to the volume, the amount that these weapons are being used. And the U.S. is now saying, reportedly, slowing down weapons transfers of these weapons in particular and others as leverage against Israel for it to not invade Rafah, which we know is already quietly happening. If you could go to the next slide, please, Grace. Of course, 155 millimeter artillery shells aren't the only weapons that General Dynamics has long provided Israel with, and certainly during this current genocide too. It is the only weapons, only U.S. weapons manufacturer that makes the metal bodies of MK-80 bombs, which are the primary bombs that Israel uses against Gaza. This photo on this slide shows these absolutely huge, sometimes 30 to 40 foot wide craters caused by Israeli airstrikes. And this was back in October, the end of October, beginning of November. So you can only imagine what things look like now and how absolutely horrifying it is. A UN weapons inspector who analyzed these photos 
stated that they, these craters were likely caused by either a general dynamics bunker buster bomb or a Boeing general purpose bomb. Grace, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So I know that a lot of us think about the Lockheed Martins and the Elbits and the general dynamics of the world's, the very obvious weapons manufacturers that are sending bombs and artillery shells, everything that, of course, we know to be and think of as traditional weapons used in war and genocide and death making. I think, at least speaking personally, we think less often of companies that supply the Israeli military with weapons, weapons components, other things that fuel the military that aren't bombs, that aren't so obvious. And I think one example of this, that actually research was just published on this the other day, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is fuel, jet fuel. We don't see on the ground jet fuel. There aren't fragments of jet fuel that Amnesty and other human rights organizations analyze and publish reports on. Jet fuel is carried in massive tankers on ships, as Dove will talk about later, under a shroud of secrecy, very hard to track and to analyze the supply chains. But researchers the other day published this great report on oil companies and fuel companies supplying the Israeli military. And one of those companies is Valero. This is a Texas-based, U.S.-based, publicly traded fuel company. And researchers found that shipments from Valero of jet fuel were sent to Israel via vessel that they tracked using import data, geolocation, tracking, really phenomenal research, and Dove hopefully can share that research and piece in the chat, otherwise we will in a bit. And the missing piece that these researchers found that previously has been so hard to track is that these shipments were very clearly labeled U.S. Department Defense Fuel Supply, with both the origin of the fuel supply being this specific Valero refinery in Corpus Christi, Texas, to Ashkelon, a coastal city in southern Israel. If you could switch to the next slide, Grace. Thank you. This I'm sure folks are very familiar with, Caterpillar, the first divestment target. Dove will talk about this in more detail later too, but another company that we see it's and I say weapons, but most people don't necessarily think of bulldozers as being weapons. In a lot of cases, we might think of Caterpillar bulldozers as building even sites that are life-sustaining, hospitals, schools, they're at construction sites. Well, they're also, of course, used by the Israeli military. They're armored and weaponized by Israeli weapons companies. They're used not only in home demolitions in the occupied West Bank, which I think is usually the context in which we see them. We see videos of Israeli soldiers and settlers demolishing Palestinians' homes in the occupied West Bank and occupied East Jerusalem. But Caterpillar bulldozers are also used by Israel in all of its attacks on Gaza and currently being used in Israel's attacks on Gaza as weapons for accompanying Israeli troops on the ground to clear roads, demolish buildings, pave the way for combat troops to unleash even more horrors. If you could go to the next slide, please. And I'll just leave off. I know that this is a bit rushed. There's so much information here, but hopefully we can answer more questions during the Q&A. But I'll leave off on a story that ties into activism, which I'm sure folks are also very familiar with. Last week was the anniversary of the killing of Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old peace activist who traveled to Gaza in 2003 to work alongside Palestinians in solidarity to help protect Palestinians' homes against demolition by the Israeli military during one of its countless attacks on Gaza. And she wrote to her mom 
before her death, before she was murdered by Israeli soldiers, crushed to death by a caterpillar bulldozer while defending the home of a Palestinian family, saying that she wanted to tell her mom, tell her world, tell her the world, excuse me, about the chronic insidious genocide that she was witnessing. And this is back in 2003, we're seeing not only the same, but also new companies involved in Israel's attacks on Gaza. We've seen Caterpillar bulldozers, all of these weapon systems for decades, new weapon systems being developed. And so the fight continues and I will pass it to Doe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Davi. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I remember actually that in 2003, I was I was active with with the with the Israeli movement, who was invited to participate in demonstrations against the apartheid wall being built at the time, and and the killing of Rachel Corey uh, was a, a tremendously meaningful event in in my life and the lives of of people around me. Um, it's a, it's a good moment to remember her. It's it's our it's a yard site this week. So Davi started by telling us that when we think about weapons companies, uh, especially the ones on our list, so if you're <laughs> muted. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, if we look at the list online, and I just put in the chat again, uh, the link to our database that is very rich, you will see a lot of companies there that don't look like weapons companies. So Caterpillar, of course, is one. But you will also see companies like Toyota and Rolls-Royce and uh, Ford and, uh, and the companies on this slide here, Google and Amazon and Palantir, potentially, and IBM should be there too. So another huge and very important expose came out in 972 magazine, which is an Israeli publication, uh, and exposed the uh, existence of AI systems that are used by the Israeli military to create mm -hmm. targets in a, in a rate that is much faster than people can. Create targets for the war machine to destroy. And uh, this AI system is hosted on platforms that are provided by tech companies. Now, it is very hard for us to know exactly uh, how these uh, tech platforms actually support the Israeli war machine. But we can highlight some of the things we do know. For example, we know that Google and Amazon are the main providers of the main cloud services to the Israeli government, including the Israeli military. For example, we do know that IBM provides the Israelis with the uh, system that they use in order to control the uh, population registry that controls all the numbers and people and information uh, of all the people in Gaza. And we also know that the notorious Palantir uh, which is a surveillance company that has sold uh, uh, very uh, uh, nefarious technologies to police departments here in the U.S. and to ICE, uh, has actually boasted about collaborating now with the Israeli war effort. We don't know how, but we know they have boasted about it. So here are some names of weapons companies that we usually don't think of as weapon companies. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, let's move uh, on. Unless you ask me about it, this is about guns and pistols and handguns. I want to zoom out a little bit, uh, a little bit about the shipments of weapons to Israel. What we know from recent publications is that the US has been sending hundreds of cargo planes into Israel since October 7th. Every day, there are full cargo planes. Now we know of almost 200 such flights, including shipments that come by sea, full of weapons. And there is a veil of secrecy over these supplies. Uh, unlike in the case of the Ukraine, where mostly we have long lists of all the weapons that are sent to the Ukraine, that are reported publicly. 
the uh, weapons sent to Israel are not reported. And it is coming out now in publications little by little of what are the different methodologies used by the State Department and the, and the, and the uh, Defense Department to conceal those supplies. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an, uh, a very partial list of, of uh, munitions and weapon systems sent to the Ukraine. We don't have such a list for Israel. Next slide, please. So some of the technologies used, the mechanisms used. So one thing that we know that they've been doing is uh, um, expediting the shipment of uh, deals that were already approved or diverting weapons from stockpiles in Israel and around Israel in different uh, military bases uh, and not reporting on that anywhere. We don't really know what's the mechanism of supplying uh, weapons from stockpiles. Uh, we know that there are shipments that go in order to replenish the stockpiles. And then we don't know who actually controls the stockpile, the US military stockpiles in Israel or in Turkey and so on. We know that uh, they were about 100 new uh, military aid, uh, foreign uh, military aid deals to Israel in the last five months. And only two of them were actually reported to Congress. And even those two uh, did not uh, expect or, or wait to uh, get congressional approval, but were approved by a, an emergency measure by the president. These two, by the way, were exactly for the same things David discussed which are the 155 artillery shells and the tank shells. These are the things that Israel and the Ukraine are getting uh, used up very quickly and are constantly shouting for more and more of them. Very indiscriminate weapons, weapons that should never be used in urban population areas. Another method that was being used is for the rest of these shipments, the 100 uh, uh, deals that uh, of, of sales to Israel that did not uh, were not reported to Congress. Uh, they did it by just uh, uh, batching them up in small batches so they don't reach the threshold for reporting. Uh, other uh, restrictions on uh, weapon exports, as some of you well know, are, for example, the Lehi Law that forbids any uh, assistance or aid to specific military units that uh, have credible, credible reports about them uh, uh, being involved in gross human rights violations. And here again, we see how in the Ukraine, there are units that are banned from accepting US military aid. I don't know if this is actually a, a very effective tool, but this is something that is happening. And in Israel, they have found ways to change the procedures in such a way that um, no Israeli military unit is, is ever uh, sanctioned that way. Another requirement that we hear about in the news lately a lot is about uh, uh, or banning uh, US aid to countries that restrict the movement of humanitarian, US humanitarian aid into conflict zones. And as we well know, this is what's happening in Gaza right now. And yet we do not see any slowdown of this aerial train, yes, of this uh, daily uh, supplies of weaponry. Next slide, please. Uh, before I go into the next slide, I just want to say, what does it mean? I, what I think it means. And what I think it means is two things. For me as a researcher, this veil of secrecy, official veil of secrecy, means that what we can show you and what we can tell you about is only the tip of the iceberg. If they reported only of, on two deals out of 100, Think about all the things we do not know. We can only show you what became public and almost none of it became public. That's one thing. In fact, one of the publications claims that there are currently about 600 pending deals between Israel and the US in the value of $24 billion. Now they're talking about extra funding to Israel of $14 billion. We're talking about a lot more than that. So that's one point. A lot of it we just don't know. The second point is obvious, which is this is not just an Israeli genocide. This is an American genocide. 
This next slide is about what we do know. And what we do know is that in the last few weeks, all of a sudden, we start seeing a lot more publications about weapons used in Gaza. They usually come from Israeli companies. They usually come from Israeli companies that want to sell those weapons. So they are using their use in Gaza as a sales pitch, as a way to promote their sales to other countries. And I've just picked a few pictures, you know, to, for the beauty of it. And just to highlight a few of these beautiful pictures, the ones on top are large weapon systems. These are platforms. You know, you see a new tank uh, called Barak. You see in the middle a new missile ship uh, uh, that, that is being used for the first time, the SAR-6. And on the right, an armored personnel carrier called a TAN, the new armored personnel carrier. Uh, it's it's being produced in Israel, but the hull is made in the U.S. by Oshkosh. Uh, the same with the tank. The, the engine is made in the U.S. and paid for by U.S. taxpayers because it is part of that military aid to Israel. But then there are also the small things. In the second line on the left, you see this little drone. There are several little drones. This is just one, one, example, so one example of these that are designed. They are, they are bought off the shelf and then they are being retrofitted. Um, this, for example, is, is a drone that can shoot. It has a gun on it, so it's an assassin drone. It's a little drone that can go around and shoot people. And we have reports of how it's being used both in Gaza and on the West Bank against civilians. Uh, there is another small drone that is being used a lot. It is, a, it is a, a suicide drone. It's a tiny little drone that goes into somebody's house and just blows itself up. What can you do about it? In the middle, you see other so, drones. Yeah. Talk about what you do about it. I think maybe we could uh, stop at this point with your presentation, terrific presentation, both you and Davi, and we'll go on to a Q&A where we will uh, encourage people to post their questions in the chat and then Medea Myself, Hania, we can pose these questions to you. Um, so the question that I have is, what would you recommend in terms of targeting these companies? You, you mentioned divestment earlier. Individuals can certainly divest if they have a portfolio, pushing uh, cities to divest, universities, uh, other thoughts, and, and how, how impactful, how effective do you think Protests are targeted protests in front of Lockheed Martin. I mean, I, I'm in Santa Barbara. It's two hours north of Los Angeles. We have what we call the infrared valley. So we have uh, Lockheed Martin north of Grumman. We have Raytheon and a, a plethora of military contractors and about 150 people. Uh, we, we came out. We were in front of uh, Raytheon screaming, quit your job. Some people were blocking the traffic, and uh, I think it was powerful for the moment, but it was, you know, we haven't followed up on that. So just thinking thinking that, you know, we should be seeing more of this. I know we, we saw it in Tucson, we've seen it in the Bay Area. Uh, your thoughts on how to best challenge these disgusting companies? Yeah, thank you so much, Marcy. So as you well know, people have been protesting these companies all around the world. Moreover, there is a call coming from Palestinian civil society and from human rights organizations around the world uh, for a, a, a military embargo on Israel. So it's, it's actually good to echo that call, you know, to make ourselves part of this international call for sanctions and not just do our own little thing, but connect to that when we do our own little thing. And a military embargo in Israel means two things. It means not sending weapons to Israel, yes, obviously, but it also means not buying weapons from Israel. You know, when I showed, showed you all these new weapons that are being now tested in Gaza, they're tested in order to be sold. This is big business as well. We need to block that big business. What we saw in Canada just yesterday, you know, with the announcement that they will stop selling um, weapons to Israel, Maybe, you know, maybe it's not a big impactful thing. They don't sell that many weapons to Israel. It's actually not a very big uh, um, uh, supplier of weapons to Israel. But symbolically, it is very powerful. One month ago, there was an action in Canada across, I think, seven different cities where activists have taken over uh, weapons companies and their factories and, and just blocked them. I am sure this has a lot to do with building leverage on the politicians, 
on public opinion to move towards ending the supply of weapons to Israel. So it sometimes feels very hard here in the US, but every little bit helps because when we protest here outside Lockheed, we find that a court in um, the Netherlands have issued a ruling saying that the Netherlands shouldn't supply any more parts for F-35s to Israel. So we move one millimeter, but then uh, activists in Latin America managed to actually endorse uh, the military embargo on Israel. And that's a big market for Israeli weapons. So every little bit helps. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your hopeful analysis, your optimism. We really need that now. And I would also just add to that, that if you're near a major university, look into what they're doing. Uh, we have the University of California up in Berkeley. They have the Nuclear Weapons Laboratory here in Santa Barbara. They're doing all sorts of research. They boast about it online for Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. And I would encourage people to submit Public Record Act requests. Uh, ask the university to give you all the documentation on their contracts with the Department of Defense or individual military contractors. Okay, next question, uh, Hania, Medea. Yeah, I can ask uh, uh, this uh, question. And I think there's there's been a ton of private messages to me directly and some questions about how we can access uh, this wonderful uh, presentation. And I wish we had all the time in the world to have you go on and on and on, Dav and Davi. I, I swear, I'm, my, I have chills right now. So um, if there's any way for our audience members to have access to your slides and, and your presentation, we would greatly appreciate it. I know that this is live um, on, on YouTube right now and on our social media uh, as well, but um, the more information, the better. How can we, and kind of to your point of how do we, now that there's a momentum and there's a ton of folks like Medea herself, who's in Congress almost every single day, encouraging uh, Congress members to just stop this genocide. How do we get our allies to either hold a hearing, introduce a resolution um, to address this and to, to, to really shine a light on all of what's happening and open up an investigation? And who would really be in charge of doing that? Right now, we do have some squad members um, in Congress that are our allies, but APAC is really going after every single one of them right now. Uh, and, and time is really not on our side, but what's the next step? Is this a question to you, Medea? Uh, no, it's a, a question to you about how do we get to see the whole presentation first? Oh, the presentation. Well, I, I'm a total geek. You know, as much as I love pictures and stories, in the end, this is about data. We have the database online. All the information is written in kind of a dry, geeky way. Uh, we can put the link again in the chat. And I want to encourage you all to use it and share it with others and use it to maybe screen the investments of your union and your church and your school and whoever, you know, whoever wants to divest from weapons. Let me also rec recommend uh, the obvious. Code Pink itself has this fabulous campaign, Divest from the War Machine. This is the time. This is the time. We need universities to divest from the war machine. We need organizations to divest from the war machine, foundations, everyone. We should step away from our own complicity um, in weapons companies. I have a question about the um, exceptionalism for U.S. sales and, quote, gifting weapons to Israel, uh, that in the case of other countries, they have to buy these from the United States. What's the case uh, that's made in Israel? What percentage can they make on their own? So uh, the deal that was, uh, I think, first made in uh, uh, Obama days uh, was a deal for 10 years of $3.4 billion a year to Israel in military aid, plus half a billion or $500 million for missile defense systems. So it amounts to 3.8, I think, no, 3.8 billion dollars a year. And it starts out with 25% of this that can be used uh, to pay for weapons made in Israel. And the rest 75% is uh, specifically for a 
uh, U.S. weapons company. So just that you understand, Israel doesn't get the money. Israel gets weapons, and it needs to use the weapons. Uh, it's the weapons companies that get the money from the U.S. Uh, government. Uh, but still, that, that uh, agreement was also about uh, shrinking that 25% to zero by 2028, I think, meaning that more and more of that sum should be used up on American weapons companies and not other weapons companies. It's actually almost meaningless because the main Israeli weapons companies are also registered in the US as US companies, and they receive the US military aid as US companies and not as Israeli companies. So just that you understand, it's not a big difference. So and Elbit Systems is, uh, is an American company. Whoa. Uh, and yeah. just a follow-up question for that. Um, right now we're trying to stop the 14 billion, uh, but uh, depending on what happens with this as we move forward, um, this memorandum for the 40 billion that was um, uh, agreed upon, uh, that goes up to what year? And is there any way to try to challenge that? Or is that pretty much set in stone till the end of the period? The $14 billion? 40, the the 3.8 billion that was agreed oh. upon for a 10 year period. Yeah, I think this is until uh, 28 and that's already signed. The 14 billion is an addendum for now. It's like urgent for now, whatever, whenever it's approved. Uh, just note that there is also in the news, this whole conversation about the new memorandum that Israel has to ascertain. It doesn't use this money in any way against international law or it doesn't impede humanitarian aid. Israel has actually signed that <laughs> a, a assertion, and now it has to be certified by the Secretary of State. And I think there was just a report yesterday from Human Rights Watch and Oxfam uh, that points the obvious, that Israel is lying. Uh, so this is, a, this is a point where we can say Israel is obviously lying. How can you certify that lie? I mean, obviously, it's not as if the U.S. government doesn't know what's happening, but there are always these little gaps where the lies become more evident. Thank you. Um, a question. Is the Iron Dome really defensive? What do you think? No. Well, the Iron well, Dome... I, 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 the Iron Dome is one of the systems. There are, I think, four or five different systems that are used to uh, uh, intercept rockets and other flying objects, uh, being uh, uh, projectiles that come either from the from the north, from uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, or from Hamas and Islamic Jihad in uh, Gaza, and um, that's what they do. Yes, this is this is a defensive weapon. Yes, but, but don't you back on that a little bit? Don't you think that the more you have shields like that, the more you encourage Israel to be genocidal, right? Because uh, they are not as afraid of retaliation. Yeah. It's like a license to kill in a way. I, I think I think all all weapons are weapons. They are used in war and they are needed in order to be used in war. And if Israel runs out of weapons it cannot and but i would say the most urgent thing if you look at what the ukraine is saying too the ukraine is also running out of of 155 millimeter shells and israel is running out of 155 millimeter shells and tack they all won't, won't want the same uh, armaments from the us and they are both kind of blaming the other one for taking those armaments from the us so it's the same stockpiles being used and obviously what it means is that if those shells are not delivered, then less people would be killed tomorrow because Israel will be running out of them. So we have a, a question here exactly. that um, Sh Shlomo has put in uh, about how do we connect the, um, the weapons manufacturers and the donations to different representatives and how can we best use this when approaching these representatives? Because right now we've just been talking about APAC money. How do we link it to the uh, weapons industry? 
Yeah, here I would really ask uh, Code Pink uh, experts to help on that. I know very little about US politics. The one comment I can add is that some of these weapons companies, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing, are so huge and they are such close partners of the US government that it goes well beyond donations to this or that candidate. In fact, they are a government within a government and in fact, they are such close partners. They actually are the implementers of US policy on so many levels, levels domestically and internationally. Uh, in, in fact, the, the US government sometimes cannot do anything without them. So how many decisions are actually made by our representatives and how, how many decisions are actually made by these companies? I don't know. Well, I think in the meantime, I would just urge people to look at the quarterly reports for this election. There are financial reports that members of Congress who are running are required to file and, you know, appoint someone to go through those reports. Uh, we've done it here uh, and find out, gee, what did you get from Lockheed Martin and what did you get from Raytheon and General Dynamics? And, and then throw it back at them and ask them to sign a pledge. Code Pink, if you search online, Code Pink Pledge. Uh, for lawmakers to refuse money from military contractors, you'll find it. Ask them to sign it. They don't want to sign it. You know, write a press release, make a big deal. It is a big deal. So with that, I, I would appreciate if everybody would unmute and we can thank our guests, Dove and Davi uh, from the American Friends Service Committee for doing all this fantastic research. We have thank lots of in the thank chat. You. And thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.